Technology is at the forefront of space exploration, engineering, and many other advanced fields. But now imagine what would happen if the internet went dark for just one day. Communications would be down, global supply chains would be disrupted, and the entire world would be a disarray. However, this is on a really large scale. And as much as digital security concerns can cause massive disasters such as this, I'm going to discuss cybersecurity on a relatively small scale, one that I see as a very serious challenge confronting our community today. As a young adult who frequently utilizes social media to communicate with my family, friends, and classmates, I've seen the lack of internet security become a major societal issue. Nowadays, technological breakthroughs have pushed the limits and bounds of digital citizenship, creating a considerable barrier to online protection. Now, cybersecurity as a whole has many different aspects which deal with many different types of attacks. There is one specific attack, however, that is extremely, extremely common. This is social engineering. And according to the IBM X4 Threat Assessment of 2023, it accounts for roughly 40% of all data breaches. Now, I personally don't believe in going through different data and statistics about how immensely threatening this situation is. What is important is that people know and are aware about it. So let's really dive into what social engineering is about. So this entire process can be boiled down or narrowed down to three key steps. The first of which is reconnaissance and elicitation, which can quite easily be conducted through a framework we call OSINT, also known as open source intelligence. As the name suggests, OSINT includes finding as much information as you can about a target and thoroughly researching them. So information such as what that person likes, dislikes, who they follow, their close-knit social circle, and so much more. Essentially, OSINT is used for analysis and decision making, and it's deemed beneficial because it makes use of publicly available information, avoiding the need for intrusive procedures. This is something you all can go home and start doing right now. Rather, it's something we're always doing when we're writing a research paper or we're looking into a company we want to invest in. However, hackers take it one step further. They automate this process, which allows them to scrub through thousands of different tweets, Instagram posts, websites, through every corner of the internet to find any and all information they can about you. Furthermore, they find different domains, IPs, contact information you didn't know exists about yourself, and the biggest of all is your digital footprint. This is a uniquely encoded trail of data specific to you regarding everything you do online. So website traffic, bank transactions, and all of your online accounts are a part of this. The reason OSINT is seen as such a crucial step is because in the hacking world, information is the most valuable currency one can have. Information is the very lifeblood in this digital age because it gives you so much influence in terms of power and leverage. Attackers can sell information on vulnerabilities, they can exploit and blackmail someone, and they can even gain a rep really strong reputation for doing so. The next step in this process is engagement and manipulation. Now this is where we actually craft the social engineering scenario, make initial contact, as well as build a report with the target. So while making initial contact, a hacker would most likely take a very personalized approach to the situation. So for example, suppose I, the hacker, have found through my research that my target is really interested in some summer program to which they've already applied to. So I could pose as the admissions officer and send a fake email to what seems like a verified account stating that they're missing some documents that need to be uploaded to a link included in the email. Once my target clicks on the link, it's game over. This specific type of scenario is known as a phishing scam or spear phishing scam, and it's one of the most common attacks that people are really susceptible to. So this link or web page that the target will click on is going to be hooked to some malicious software the attacker is using. But what is this software really? And how powerful is it? Welcome to every hacker's home, the Linux OS. The Linux kernel serves as the foundation for the family of open source operating systems known as Linux. In short, it's a free, adaptable, and secure platform for your computer. Now there are, of course, many different flavors of Linux, but one that is most commonly used in the hacking community is known as Kali Linux. In a nutshell, Kali Linux is a Debian-based distribution system and has a wide arsenal of exploits with its main use for pen testing and ethical hacking. It has, as I said, a wide range of tools such as Nmap, Wireshark, the Social Engineering Toolkit, and my personal favorite, the Metasploit Framework Console. Now, I've tested a couple of these and I've done some harmless stalking on a few of my friends. And funnily enough, I found out that one of them has 68 different online accounts. That's 68 different ways a hacker could access their lives. And what's even crazier is that the average person creates more than 100 accounts in their lifetime. That's a pretty big online social presence. That's 100 different ways your lives could be ruined and your reputations damaged. Now, the final step in this process is post-exploitation. 
Essentially, now the hacker having all your information and credentials can do anything they want with it. So this could mean that they pivot within your network, they could contact people close to you and exploit them, and they could even exfiltrate private and confidential data. Now, the exact focus of post-exploitation is really dependent on the attacker's intent as well as the environment. So whether it's researching on human weakness or building on a really successful exploit, there are many interpretations which really show the multifaceted approaches there are to this step in the wider scheme of social engineering. Now, technology is pretty cool, and it's a really useful tool. But at the end of the day, that's all it is. It's just a tool. This advanced, or rather complex, machinery that attackers would use would be nothing without the connection that binds it together, the human mind. That person sitting behind that screen not only should need to know how to use these technological tools, but they also need to understand human behavior on a fundamental level. This is exactly what makes social engineering such a complex and potent threat. Attackers really dig deep into their targets, finding out about their emotional triggers, you know, what makes them tick, and they exploit their cognitive biases. Essentially, they need to make sure that the target bypasses all rational thinking. Social engineering combines psychological manipulation, technical competence, as well as social skills. It's really the infusion of these that make it such a powerful attack. You know, a well thought out or well executed social engineering attack will include a multitude of different psychological concepts as well as these tools and your personal information to maximize its impact and damage. Now, I don't want to bore anyone by endlessly restating different safety measures, which I'm sure you've heard over and over again. Rather than go through some unapplicable precautions, I think it's important that people understand what's going on here on a fundamental level. So even though I do suggest that everyone knows about the most subtle details that go into a social engineering attack, if you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, it's important to understand that it's not always about hacking the device, but it's also about hacking the person. Now, what does that mean? You obviously can't log onto a terminal and send signals to your brain. Of course not. What I'm trying to say is that it focuses on the human factor. It exploits people's inherent tendencies, emotions, and vulnerabilities to trick them into giving up valuable information or access. If you think about it, it's sort of like someone leaving their door opened or unlocked, or rather even giving you the key themselves. So I'm going to end this off by saying, don't be that unlocked door. Yes, technology is a big part of it, but don't neglect the human factor. Try to take advantage of it, try to understand it, and use it to create really your own personal mental firewall. If you can use it at the right moment and at the right time, you might just be in the clear. Thank you. <laughs>